to get together as a family with a different feeling than the feelings we have when we have other worldly meetings. Here we truly feel we are children of God, and therefore members of the real family. It's a family get together in the real sense because inwardly we know that our souls are made of the essence of the same Lord who is our Creator. Therefore, our souls yearning to return to the real home are waiting to find the real Father, not the one that begot the body, but the one that begot the Spirit. And this awareness that we are Traveling in that direction makes us a special family. This is like a special family gathering. And I find it is quite popular considering that so many friends have traveled long distances to make it today. We are very happy that uh, we can greet Mary Chansky today, one of the oldest satsangis of uh, Chicago area and of this country, in fact, the United States, who was initiated by a perfect living master long ago, and who has been rejoicing in the awareness that she got. Today is her birthday, and I think you will all join with me in wishing her a very happy birthday. Well, nice to meet you all. Happy birthday. May we sing? May we sing? Happy birthday for Mary. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mary. Happy birthday to you. Did a good job, Mary. When we celebrate birthdays or birthday anniversaries, we want to recognize that being born is an event of significance. What is the significance of being born? The significance is that we are able to come into this physical world through a physical body with physical senses, with a physical mind and with physical awareness created by the soul in the self. When we come into this physical world and are born into this world, we have entered into one of the greatest opportunities that exists in the whole of creation. It is only when we are born in this physical world that we have the opportunity to escape from the prison house of continuous experience and go back into the highest level of awareness to our father's home. The physical form is the top of creation. Therefore, to be born in the physical body is to be born in a form that represents the top of creation. It's a great event. That is why we celebrate birthdays and feel great happiness. We rejoice. When we are born, we forget who we are. That is the tragedy. We forget who we are because we get scattered. Our attention gets scattered outside of the physical body, does not realize that the physical body was a great vehicle, a great covering around us through which we could have discovered the highest possible levels of awareness and consciousness. Instead of taking advantage of this physical body, we forget the reality lying inside the body and through the nine apertures fixed on the body, we scatter our attention throughout the material world outside, thereby losing the great advantage of birth. And then, if we are really blessed and lucky, one day we come across the great experience of being initiated into this awareness of rediscovering the purpose of the physical body and finding out this was a body not meant merely for scattering ourselves into the world, 
but to discover the higher worlds within. When that happens, we call it a rebirth. And unless we are reborn in this body, there is no chance of our finding the great beauty, the great realizations lie inside us. When we talk of the body being the temple of the living God, when we talk of the highest possibilities of realization being in this body, we talk of the possibilities only when we are reborn to the awareness of the presence of God within us. This process of establishing the presence of God within us is called rebirth or initiation. Therefore, initiation is another very great day for us because on that day we can say happy birthday again. It is the day when we are reborn into a new awareness and a new possibility of discovering the beauty of God's gift to us, which is this body. So birthdays are great, at least they remind us of the great potential that lies within this human body in physical creation. We have a wonderful mind with us, which is a very good servant, but very bad master. If you use the services of the mind as a slave, as a servant, it does a good job. Excellent job. Whatever you tell the mind to do, it can do a beautiful job. Mm. But if you start getting instructions from the mind, it's a very bad master. It leads us astray. It takes us away from the reality of our own soul within ourselves and puts us before the wolves of desires and sense experiences in the material world outside. Makes us feel there is nothing else except what is outside. This spell which has been cast upon us by our own minds makes us look only in outward direction, even for the truth and for reality. The result is that we take this physical world alone to be real. We take nothing else as real. Even when enlightened people, masters, purmukhs, those who have made some progress on this path, those who have had inner experiences, when they come and share their experiences with us, we try to understand those experiences as if it is something subtle that we can close our eyes and experience. As if it is another very clear, beautiful dream. But even while listening to them, while imagining, imagining what is higher consciousness, what is higher realization, we continue to take physical world as real. When we take this physical world as real, and there is no way to get out of it, then what we begin to consider as a higher region, as a higher level of consciousness, becomes a mere concept. Even God becomes a concept. Even the kingdom of God becomes a concept. And all the teachings of the masters and of religion, they become concepts for us. And we read more and study more and dwell more upon those concepts. And we rejoice that we have found the way. And we think continuously about those concepts. And all the time we are taking the physical body and the physical material world around us as real. People who talk of the reality of an inner experience, of the illusion of this life, just pinch them and see how their ouch is more real than their discourse on the inner reality. <laughs> the truth is, this is so real. It is so difficult to get out of this reality. It is not easy. We cannot wish it away. There are some things we can wish away. You have fear of a shadow in the dark. Somebody can say, come, I'll put out the light. That's only a shadow. There is nobody there. You might get out of this fear. But the experience of this physical world and this physical body, which we are having every day, is so real. There is no wishing away. Even all the concepts do not make us get out of this feeling that this physical world is real. And what do we do? We are trapped. We are trapped in the reality of a physical body and a physical world and there is no way to get out of it. We try to do meditation. 
we try to withdraw our attention inside. When we try, we put the stress on the body. When we think in our heads, we put the attention on the physical mind. When we try to consider this body as the house of the Lord, we take its physicality as a reality and want to find the spiritual Lord within a physical reality of the body. Even when we try to do meditation, the fact we take this gross material physical body as real does not give us anything except imaginary experiences of concepts. We build up concepts, we build up anticipations, we build up expectations, we build up stages of higher realization, we build up our own ideas of God and peace and happiness and bliss and try to live in that imagination as long as we can in the name of meditation. But all the time, we are waiting when we can finish that meditation session and get back to the business of the real physical world. <laughs> we can't get out of it. People do meditation for several hours a day. And after several hours, they are back to what they think is the real world. What are we doing? We are doing the natural thing. We are merely expressing our experience. Experiences that we are trapped in a physical level of consciousness, and when we are in this level of consciousness, nothing is real except the physical world. If this were not so, masters would not come and give us the message to go with it. If we were not so fully trapped in the physical world, masters would not walk in our midst. God would not become human and flesh. If this were not so, it is not necessary for God to become human like us and give us a teaching if we knew that this physical world is not real. But so strongly entrenched are we in the experience of this physical world being real that all the concepts that we have of something which is non physical, which is spiritual, all those concepts are fitted and contrasted with the reality of the physical world. What is the result? The result is God can come and accost us, encounter us, talk to us only at the physical level. The trap is so subtle that we find that the only way to have a contact with God is itself at the physical plane. If God comes in human form, and stands before us and talks to us, we can accept that as real conversation. If we talk to God in our own minds, we are never sure. It's a concept. And the mind is playing a good game. When people say, we hear the voice of God, they do not know. It may be the voice of the mind. It may be the voice of the devil. There is no way to find out. And what God? What is God like? He has a face and eyes and nose. What does God look like? Let us say God is not physical, he is spiritual. What does he look like? Why should we presume he looks like us? Is it not a concept based upon our own looks? What if God were totally formless? How do we visualize him? How can we visualize something that is formless? How if God were a word? An unspoken word? How about God being an unspoken melody? An unspoken hum? Supposing we had a hum around us, a sound, and we, somebody said, do you know that's God? What would you do with it? What would be our relationship with it? If you were given a choice, look, either you can have a human being as a friend or that sound of a humming bee as your sound, what would you like? Take the human being. You wouldn't know what to do with the humming sound. Therefore, we are so situated, we have left no choice but for God to express himself 
in the same form in which we are. And therefore, we find him in human form. Therefore, while we are in human form, God is met and seen in human form. This is not something that has happened in this country or in this century or in these days. This has been the truth forever. And this will be the truth forever. The truth is that the God who created us, who created all forms and created his own forms and we are also his forms and who created millions and myriads of his own forms remain formless. And for forms to contact him, he assumed forms. Therefore, if God has to assume a form for his own forms to recognize him, he becomes flesh like us. He becomes human like us. And he walks in our midst. And he talks to us. And he becomes like us. And he gives us the same thing which, he, which we would get if we could get God in his formless form. The distinction is not in the form. The distinction is in what we get. When we meet the real thing, the real being, the real creator, real God, in whatever form, the impact on us is the same. We have met our real source. It takes away our loneliness, our grief, our separation, our helplessness, our trap, our being in the state. It takes away by giving us something real and we feel happy. We get intoxicated. We get a strange joy. We do not know how to describe it. We want to run out to the streets and tell people we found it. But then the people say, you are crazy. <laughs> so oh, yeah. we keep quiet. So we come back home and we sit inside and we do not know whether to open our eyes or to close. We do not know what to do. We found it. We found the real thing. We found the real being. We do not know what to say about it. But we have experienced it. When such an encounter takes place that we can meet the creator, God, in human form, it has such a strong impact upon us that we don't want to lose that experience. The physical experience is temporary because our physical bodies are temporary. And if God takes a physical form and comes in our midst, he also comes in a temporary vehicle, in a temporary form. We don't want to miss it. We don't want to lose it. We want to be close to it. We have experienced love for that form. Therefore, we want to find a form that does not die. A form that does not go away. And therefore, we go within to see, is there a form which does not go away? Is there a form that is not based upon the physical presence of God? And thus we discover the form of God which is not physical. See the starting point? It is never the other way around that you first have an experience of the spiritual form of God and then you come across and see him in all human beings. Like some people claim it should be. The mind claims it should be in that order. First develop faith, develop the feeling or an experience of the presence of God within you and then you will see God and love in everybody. People are waiting for that for centuries. They are waiting everywhere. They are waiting in this country. They, ultimately they become skeptics. They become atheists. It doesn't work that way. On the other hand, when you meet the human form with which you fall in love, you, you want that presence to be there all the time and that presence is not there all the time then you want to develop that contact within and the pull within establishes a form which is not the same as human but is real. That is how the journey within starts. The starting point in our situation is physical. From the physical we move to the spiritual not the other way around. The wonderful thing about this process of moving on the spiritual journey is we have a point of reference. We have a point of relationship. When we are within, we can relate to the experience outside. 
if we see a form within, we can relate to the experience of the form outside. That makes it real. It makes it real because the form outside was not made up by our mind. And therefore, the form inside is not made up by our mind. Even if it is made up by our mind, it is a relationship to the form outside which gave us the experience of spiritual love that nothing else had ever given before. I am highlighting the importance of experiencing the physical love of a physical form of the manifest God in order to have any spiritual progress within at all. Now look at the history of the saints and the mystics and the masters and the beautiful enlightened people in the Orient, in the Occident, in Tibet, in India, in China, in the Middle East, in every country. Look at the history of people who had spiritual experiences and you will see they had it in the same order. They had the great impact of a human being who was enlightened and they carried that impact within and get, got inner experiences. I have sometimes met people who were well known for their spiritual enlightenment. I have met them up in the mountains of India. I have met them in Tibet. I have met them in remote regions where one would assume they must be having their inspiration from the mountains, from the snow peaks, from nature. And then I have talked to them and I said, how on earth could you get such a strange experience? And they always pointed out to me the beauty of their master who gave them their life. It's so wonderful to get that reassurance that even people living in remote areas who have got enlightenment and have the intoxication of a permanent joy, they got it from a human living master. Some human being affected them so much that they got real knowledge from within. Even the masters, even perfect living masters, you go to them and talk to them. And they are constantly rejoicing in the experience of having met their master. It is said, even those who were born with the light are singing the praise of the adopted masters after they were physical. It is said of Kabir, I mentioned his name earlier, Kabir the great mystic. People believe he was enlightened from childhood. And people did not know who he, he would praise since he talked of truth, reality, God, spirituality right from young age. And as he grew up, he praised Dharamdas as his teacher. People knew that Dharamdas was a disciple, but he accepted him as a teacher. To sustain this strange relationship between the impact the physical form of Lord God has upon his seekers. This does not mean that the seekers are following the person of that, of that guide or that master. Look at Swamiji. You read his books, Swamiji? Which one? Sarbachan? Yes. Anybody heard of Swamiji? Of Agra? In whose name today the whole Radha Swami movement is going on? They all owe allegiance to Swamiji. And they think that Swamiji has given all this to us. He did not draw the attention of people to any human being. He talked of the great wisdom within. And yet you go and ask him, how did he get it? Tulsi Sahib gave him. A name very few people know about. You hear me talking of great master, GM, all the time. People ask who is GM and I say general manager <laughs> of all affairs. But if I ever spoke to great master myself, he would say, Baba Ji is doing a good job. Yeah. People who were perfect and left no doubt in our minds, the way they recognized the impact of their masters shows how important it is in the spiritual path to 
have a perfect living master as the focal point, as the point to which you can relate, as the point which is serving as verification of all spiritual experiences. Because you are not creating that form, nor is your mind doing that job. It's the Lord putting you in touch with such a being through the sheer process of coincidence. When the Lord puts you in touch with such a being through coincidence, then surely that impact is not created by you at all because you don't create any coincidences. Therefore, after that, all spiritual experiences within become meaningful because they can be related to the physical presence, the physical form, the physical experience with that human being. If you ask that human being, are you there in my inner experiences? Because I see you sometimes. And the human being says, what experiences tell me also? <laughs> <laughs> Why? To retain the human being's status as a human being. To retain the human form. And yet, in the very next breath, that human being can answer your question before you could ask. This combination of such a human being remaining totally ordinary and yet answering our questions as if he is the same being who is always inside is the most remarkable thing about the spiritual path. Once having found that kind of equation and that relationship, one can relate all inner experiences to that human being. One can imagine the form of that human being. One can contemplate upon that face, upon that form, upon that smile, upon that way of looking, upon those eyes, upon that forehead. One can look at, remember the voice, one can remember the words. And as one contemplates on the face, form, words, sound of that human being, it becomes more and more real within and gets merged with the real eternal form of our own creator, which we would never have understood but for this relationship. In truth, the real form of God, which manifests as the spiritual master for each one of us, is the form of sound and light within. That is the true master. But there is no way to communicate with that master. There is no way to understand that master. There is no way to understand God in that form except through mental conjecture, through mental concept which drives us away from the reality. But when we have that experience with a human being outside, we recognize the same human being in the same light and sound with it. And we move from the transient physical form of the Lord to the form of a physical living form of a master to the permanent non-transient form of the Lord and the Master who is within. Our real spiritual Master is always within us. And we have access to that Master 24 hours throughout our life. He never goes away. He is always there. We go away by diverting our attention. He never goes away. We go away because we do not have adequate contact with him, with him. But when we establish the contact outside and experience love and devotion, that love and devotion makes the inner contact more real. And the same face, the same form can be seen in the illumination and light within. And then even if we do not see the face, the light itself is always the same face. It is a strange experience. Go with it. Go with it and see the light. And see what it means as a concept and as an experience. Go with it and see the light, the flickering of light, the expansion of light, the big light ball coming, the flame coming and disappearing, leaving no impact on you. And look at that light as the form of the master that you saw. And see his face in that light. And see his feet in that light. And see the light emanating from the form that you saw outside. You are drawn to it and you know this was the real form of the master. 
Why? Because one is a mental concept, the other is real. But there is no real verification of what I am saying now, except going within. So the next step, after we are lucky enough to encounter a human being who fits the description of a perfect living master, the next step is to go within and get a personal verification of this. The spiritual path is the most beautiful path because it is not based upon blind faith. It is not based upon blind belief. It is based upon day-to-day -day experience. Every other intoxication in this world disappears after a while and we have a hangover. <laughs> but the intoxication of happiness, of being able to remember the beloved who is real, the Lord who is real, one who is real, whose form we can see, visualize, imagine, contemplate, that intoxication does not go. No way to take it off. That is why the spiritual way takes us to a verified experience. And the confidence of a verified experience is so different from the speculative mental conjecture about possible spiritual paths. The mind fights, the mind creates concepts, the mind creates ego, the mind creates highness, I will find out, I will do this, I will do that. I know how to do it. I am fed up. I will do this now. This I, I will do, will try, will do it. This business of the ego and the mind that is going on all the time, this restlessness never ends except in the bliss and intoxication of love and devotion for the Lord in the form in which we saw him outside appearing within. When that form appears within and we are intoxicated, and satisfied and contented. There is no bliss left. That is the first time our mind overcomes restlessness and feels satisfied and contented. Therefore, it is necessary to verify this by inner experience in order to understand the spiritual significance of a living master. The living master just to be ordinary, plays games with us all the time. Acts so human. Reads newspapers to know the news of the world, which he has created. <laughs> Travels in the trains and the aeroplanes to go to places which he himself has set up as illusions. Talks to us with the innocence of a child and doesn't let us see through except by hints and innuendos, <laughs> makes us feel that we should not get so tied down to the physical that we forget to go within, forces us virtually to go within because of the feeling of missing him when he is not physically present. He plays all these games and that is how he creates in us love and devotion for the Lord for himself. And love and devotion is the real way to go within. Love and devotion is the secret of the spiritual way. Love and devotion is the way. What about meditation? Meditation is like a thermometer. When you put a thermometer in your mouth and you read it, it will tell you how much fever you have. It cannot create you. Meditation can tell you how far you have gone. It cannot take you far. What takes you far is love and devotion. Therefore, meditation, mechanically done, leads you nowhere. Meditation done with love and devotion takes you far and tells you how far you have gone. If you only had love and devotion, you would still go far. Have you heard the story of the sick saint who was asked by his master to make mud platforms? How many of you heard the story? You heard that? There was a great master once, many years ago, about maybe about 400 years ago. 
400 years ago, there lived in India a perfect master. And the perfect master said, I am growing old. I must determine who is going to take over my job. I have been giving spiritual guidance to people all these years. I am old. Somebody should take over. But I want to carefully test all these contestants. So many people come up and claim they have done good job. They have done a lot of worship and they are now fit to be master. I want to test if they are fit for mastership. If they can be appointed as masters. So let all the claimants appear tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock in the open yard outside. Hundreds of people appear. All saying, Master, see, we are all ready. Well dressed up, all ready to, to answer any questions in the test. So the master came and he laid down a simple test. He said, my test is very simple. It's a practical test. There's a pile of dirt lying there. A pile of mud and dirt. Here is open space. Make beautiful platform. Whoever makes the best platform will be picked up by me. They all got busy. They said, this is simple. We thought he's going to put us to some written test or some oral questions on spirituality. But he's given us a very simple task. So people began to make those wooden, no, those earthen. What do you call them? Earthen? Clay. Clay? <laughs> clay platforms. <laughs> people began to make those clay platforms from that clay which was lying there. And the master came and saw all of them. He says, I don't think you have done a good job. They don't look pretty at all. <laughs> Demolish them. Break them. Make new ones. You must come up to a minimum standard before I can accept any of these clay models as real. So they broke everything and started making them all over again. Mm. And when they made them again, the master came. They are not very good. I think there's something wrong. Maybe the light is not proper here. Why don't you start in that corner? So they all carried their clay and went to the other corner. And started making theirs. After four or five rejections there, mm. the master said, baby, this place is not good. The clay is not good. Let's go to the back side. A lot of people left at that time. He said, now we are convinced this guy has got too old. We don't know what he's doing. So the number became fewer and fewer. Then he kept on demolishing. He said, this clay is bad. We have to go to the other section. Yes. So they moved to another place. Location. Location. They changed the location. Mm -hmm. And they used that clay. Ultimately, everybody said, what's happened to this man? He's really gone senile. Senile, senile. Senile. <laughs> and he doesn't know what he's doing. They all left. Except one man. He kept on making the clay platforms. And the master kept on demolishing them. And he kept on making. People said, are you a fool? What are you doing this for? Is this spirituality? <laughs> Do you see any spiritual truth in this? Something wrong with the master. He says, I don't know. The man said, I don't know what is spirituality. I only know. If this master makes me keep on making and breaking these clay platforms all my life, I'll be content in that I have been able to do what my master wants me to do. Eventually, he was named as the successor and became one of the masters. What does the story prove? The story proves that the real test was not the test of meditation, of scholarship, of learning. The real test was of love and devotion. When one has love and devotion, one will do anything Please the master. When we have that feeling and spirit in our mind and hearts, we'll do anything to please the Lord. The Lord gives us everything that we want, everything that we need, and beyond, and even more. Have we ever thought of it? Have we ever contemplated we want to do that which pleases the Lord? As against that which pleases our mind. So there must be an option. What is the option? Either we do things to please our mind or we do things to please the Lord. <clears throat> Have we ever decided from today onwards, I will only do that which pleases the Lord? And who's the Lord? Creator. Inside. How do I know? Through that form, the master. Let me see if I can keep on doing that. 
and when that form leads me within to the form which is formless, it consists of light and melody. Then it consists of melodious light. And when that is real for me and I can communicate with that, then can I do everything to please God within at all times? If you made this kind of a deal with our mind, okay, mind you do what you like, but let me not give up pleasing to the Lord. You get everything that the spiritual path has to offer. You travel to the highest regions. You go to the top levels of consciousness. You go to such Khand. You go to every highest point ever mentioned in any literature. That's the secret. Because what you are expressing is the love and devotion for the Lord. The truth. We need so many things in our life. We are constantly thinking of if we could have a better home, if we could have a new car, if we could buy some new clothes, if we could have a little more money to pay off for this, if we could travel to that point, if we could spend more time, if we could give up job and still be somewhere, all kinds of things we need and we ask for. And then not too many friends, not too many real friends who listen to us. Friends promise and then back out. Relatives promise and back out. Gradually we come to the realization nobody is real. They are all investing in us because they think they will get a return. It is more or less like a business transaction with all these people. Who do we turn to? We ultimately turn to the Lord. Lord, you alone are the giver for all people and we worship you and you give us. And when your blessings are there, when your grace is there, we will get whatever we need. And we need so many things. And as we have love and devotion for the Lord, He gives us all the things. He fulfills all our needs. He takes good care of us. And we can feel He is taking good care of us. He gives us a spanking once in a while to shape us up. Like the Clay potter, right when he hand. makes the pot on that revolving disc and puts the clay, a piece of clay, to make a lovely pot, a hollow pot in which something can, worthwhile can be placed. When the potter makes the pot and the clay goes round and round, he puts his hand and makes a hollow, stacks from outside <laughs> and gives the support from within. That's how the beauty of the pot comes out. The Lord gives us all we need. Spanking from outside, supporting from inside, gives us beautiful shape. And we become real devotees of the Lord. If He gives us everything we need, and He controls our lives, and we have faith and trust in Him, He does everything for us. What does He need? Have you ever thought of that? If He needed nothing, because He is the giver of everything, why would he create me? He created everything of which he was made. We are the essence of the same law. He created everything that was him. In him can be found everything. Everything, every experience, every feeling, every emotion, everything around every part of creation is from him. Need is from him. Love is from him. Hatred is the opposite to be able to experience. He created everything. That is why his response is the best when we offer whatever love and devotion we can. That's the greatest gift, the greatest offering we can make to the Lord. Our love and devotion to the Lord is the greatest gift we can make. And we should make it all the time. And our meditation should be an offering of love and devotion. Our meditation should concentrate on being in His presence, in the form in which we see Him physically. Offer Him within with love and devotion. And then His response is the best. We may get emotional. Let us get emotional within. We may have great feelings of service. Let us serve Him within. Go within. Recognize Him. From the flickering glimpse that he gives outside and offer all the love and service that we can within. 
and he'll give everything to us. So the spiritual path becomes so beautiful and so simple, even a little child can understand, an old man can understand. It is the path in which we being lost in this physical world of matter, we being trapped in the physicality of everything, we being unable to take anything as real except the physical, material part, are granted the grace of the Lord by His coming in physical form and hitting us with an impact that He is real and is present and is around and can be recognized and that we must go within to find it. When we go within to find its real form and relate it to the external experience and that fills us with love and devotion and makes meditation and contemplation on the Lord meaningful and real. And as we do that, we go on the path towards the reality, love and devotion. And retaining that intoxication, we can still continue to live in the physical world, enjoying the beauty. Every time we see the physical form outside, it looks more beautiful. When we go within, the form within becomes even more beautiful because relatable to what happened. When we open our eyes and come back, the physical form becomes still more beautiful because then it is related to what we saw within. And when we go within, that form becomes still more beautiful. When we see the wonderful sights and sounds within, the sights and sounds outside look so much be more beautiful because they are made out of that. We know what stuff they are made of. We have a point of reference to understand, appreciate, enjoy and live in bliss in this physical world because of the point of reference within and to enjoy meditation, going within, moving on the spiritual path because of the point of reference outside. What a perfect life. This perfection is possible while we are still human in this world, in this body, by creating a feeling of love and devotion to the physical form of a perfect living master outside and to the melodious light form of the same perfect Lord within which we see in meditation. If we can keep up this relationship, we are on top of the world. Then after that, go forth and live in this world with courage. You are strong. You have the support of the strongest being who created everything. You feel you are on your right side, on your back, supporting you. The creator himself. You feel you have entered the king's palace. The king said, I support whatever you do. You go with all that strength of your father's hand behind you. We are no longer like orphans, not knowing who the father is, where we are going. The whole lifestyle, the whole physical life changes. Physical human life is the greatest life because of this possibility that I just described. And unless somebody comes in our way and opens our eyes to this reality, we are unable to see this potential. But once it happens, it's great. We are very fortunate that we have this possibility open to us. When we seek, we find. This possibility is open to us, to each one of us today. So many of us are so blessed to have had rebirth into an awareness that this is an opportunity for going up, going into reality and experiencing the reality of the physical world also. So many of us have a anchor on which we can stay in firmness, the anchor of remembering the Lord in the physical form outside, in the spiritual form inside. It makes all the difference to us. I am going to be out of this country again as I mentioned. Next few days I am leaving. We will be back in the beginning of September. And we may resume these meetings after I come back. And uh, Diane will notify people who have left the telephone numbers. Okay. So, again, I welcome you. We give our best wishes to Mary Jihansky. To the Master, dear. To the Master. Can you sing that Diwali song you had in November with Effie Proper? 
do we have that uh, song here? We can sing the other one. Yes. Mm. How many can sing Satguru Tarkaro Parosa? Have perfect faith on the Master and you have nothing to worry thereafter. These two lines in my language, okay? Yeah. Indian language? Yes, that's all right. Okay. You begin. Sat Gaur Par Karo Baro Sa Phir Kuch Na Karo Ab So Sa Sat Gaur Par Karo Baro Sa Ji Phir Kuch Na Karo Ab So Sa Ji Sat Gaur Par Karo Baro Sa Ji फिर कुछ ना करो अफसोस आजी सत गुर पार करो भरोसा फिर कुछ ना करो अफसोस दिस मींस हैव फुल फेथ एंड ट्रस्ट इन द सपोर्ट इन द मास्टर इन द लॉर्ड देन यू डोंट हैव टू वरी अबाउट एनी it's not a qualified promise it's unqualified we have faith in the lord there is nothing for us to worry about he takes full care if we have half faith then he says he gives us a chance to build up faith and he says okay go ahead try on your own then then if you have trouble come back to me then we have trouble pretty soon after that <laughs> <laughs> so have full faith <laughs> the Lord is in don't worry about anything. Yeah, that's beautiful. Any questions or comments? Mm-hmm. Why is it that some people have faith and some people don't? Is it the quality of the mind, the purity of the mind, the concentration of the mind, the, the, the faults of the mind? Why do some people have faith and some people don't? When they know better and they have these concepts, as you say, for so long. This uh, life of ours has been created as a cumulative effect of long experience, not only of this life, but of many lifetimes. As you know, there are two aspects that govern the functioning of our mind. One is called karma, which generates events in our life. The pralabdha or fate or destiny creates such incidents like birth death accident and so many uh, coincidental happenings of life they are all created by pralab then there is the karma karma which is when the mind feels it can choose between options alternatives and make decisions and that karma which is called action karma is the one which leads to further destiny so when we live in this life there are two types of karma operating the one which is already determined the one which we are making now the fate karma or the action karma the pralabha and the karma the whole of life from birth to death can be filled up with these it looks like the there are several signal posts put into life which are prolable we were born with it we couldn't help it it just happened where we were born when we were born we couldn't help it it started and then after that so many things happened over which we had no control in between it looks that we are filling in the gaps with deliberation and taking decision on our own and making a pattern of life at the time of death we fill up all the gaps and become one life and stand it then the next one starts the human form or less or more depending upon what happened in this lifetime the total effect on the mind of all these karma pralabha and karma is to build up a new set of karma and a new set of attitudes the new set of karma goes directly into a reserve account called the sinchit karma sinchit is a reserve karma 
and from the synchit is pulled out a small sample which becomes Pralabhada D. The synchit keeps on growing and the Pralabhada becomes limited. So, if we have been in this path of long experience on the physical plane for billions of years, birth of the birth of the birth, then we are all souls in the physical level. In that case, we have had a large reservoir of Sinchit Karma and several types of life. While events can be traced back to the individual events that happened in the past, what is the cumulative effect of all the karma together, including Sinchit? The cumulative effect is in building up mental attitude. So, mental attitude is the offshoot of karma. It is not karma, but it is the result of karma. And that is called sanskar. You heard that word sanskar. Sanskar, sanskar is the cumulative effect of karma. And sanskar it can go back into very long periods and is not relatable to any particular individual karma. When we say some people have more love and devotion and faith and some are less, it is based upon sanskar more than individual karma. We come with these sanskars based on the large amount of experience that goes behind us. The experience can be in any of the form in which souls can exist, any of the form which Lord has created. All living forms are souls in existence. Life is created by a soul. Even a tree has a soul in it. Even a plant, even an insect, even little animals, birds that fly, fish and fowl, they all have souls. And the soul is undergoing an experience as it is leaving the life of a tree, of a bird, of an insect. And while that is a bhog yuni, bhog yuni means a life in which karma is being repaid. It cannot create karma. A fish cannot create karma. An insect cannot create karma. A tree cannot create karma. They have come to repay, not to create. The only form in which we create karma is the human form. Because the human form alone goes through the experience of choice making, of free will. This free will is responsible for the creation of this karma. So, when we go through a long process, because of karma of one lifetime, we go through a long period as a tree. The sanskar is more of a tree than of the human being. So, we become wooden, we become dense, we don't want to budge from the position we take, and these can be seen. As we live our lives. After that, you may have a few lives which are different. You have a few lives of birds. You want to fly, you don't want to get tied down, you feel miserable if you are at one place. All those attitudes and tendencies, propensities. Attitude is not the right word. Propens propensities and tendencies. Those propensities and tendencies are created from this sanskar. When we find different people and you could have access to their past lives, you would find that the cumulative effect of past lives creating sanskara is really responsible for some having faith so quickly and some not. When one is exposed to a spiritual path, say a perfect living master. Why do I say perfect living master? Because there are a lot of living masters. There are lots of them. Anybody who can teach us something which makes us go within or makes us love the Lord or gives us the insight into spirituality is a master. There are lots of them, but there are very few perfect living masters, extremely rare. What's the difference between the two? Spiritual masters who can give guidance to us to go within, spiritual masters who can lead us within, may lead us to the astral regions, to the causal regions, to universal mind, may give us access to past lives, Akashic records, but they will confine us to the mental realm. They do not take us beyond the mind. Therefore, they do not take us beyond karma. So long as you are within the mental regions, you do not go out of the law of karma and reincarnation and rebirth. But when you meet a perfect living master, his consciousness has gone beyond the mind. He goes into the pure spiritual regions which are beyond universal mind, even, which are beyond karma, beyond Akashic records. When you meet such a person, 
in the course of this evolution of spirituality, in the course of your own lives, you meet such a person once and have an eye to eye contact once with no word exchanged, you have broken your own chain of the world at that point. How many times you may come again before you get away is a matter of time. Is a matter of time to be determined by your soul scars, by the package of karma. How much love and devotion will grow in you will depend upon what previous lives you had led up to that point. But it is certain that you are a marked soul who will be going out. Then it is a certainty you will be initiated into the spiritual path if you have had that experience with a perfect living master who, although he is amongst us, although he is an ordinary person, is carrying that consciousness and therefore he is blessing like the Lord directly blessing us. The experience is that the Lord has directly walked into our midst, come all the way down. Yeah. Then he blesses, come on. Yes, this is the one I wanted to take back with. My lost sheep, I am going to pick you up and take you. It's that experience. After that, initiation is inevitable. And once initiated, going within and having love and devotion is inevitable. Then, the time that we take or the differential of time that we take or different people take depends upon what was the type of karma immediately preceding it. So you see some distinctions between people. Some have a hard time overcoming the, the doubts of their mind, constantly arguing to themselves and to others, trying to constantly get some reassurance, not being sure, still afraid, still afraid to do the next thing. And the others who are just waiting as if they were just ready to get it. Mostly you will find that when we have had a series of experiences of human birth, we are more ready to go. One good thing is, if you have contact with the perfect living master once, you never go back into any lower form of life. If you have been initiated by a perfect living master, you have to go out of the system within a maximum of four lives. So it's a very short period compared to how much time we have spent here. These look like fancy things, but they are real. <laughs> and the reality can be seen within because all these things are being controlled almost automatically from the various levels of consciousness within each one of us. Each one of us has the ex access to go within and see how this system is operating. Because each one of us represents the local, physical outlet of the consciousness of God. Since it is an outlet, a local, physical, we confine it to what the mind allows us to confine. When we allow to go within and see what is our reality, we go on expanding. Ah, I am more than what I thought I was. Ah, I am more, I am more, I am more ultimately. I was the one that set it up all up. This process is so beautiful. But the way this experience comes is like a person says, I want to have some nice dream. And I want to have a good, good experience. I, I like a certain kind of dream. And the person sits down and does daydreaming. I am there, now I am doing that. Now I met a lot of people and that person is saying this and that person is saying this. As the dream continues. All the persons look real and all of them become real and the whole real world comes up in that dream and it's all made by one person. And one person says, I want to get up out of this. I am I'm fed up of this. Another says, but you can't get up. How do you get out of this? Third person says, do you know masters exist? Then another one comes in, I am the masters. And all the time you are seeing this wonderful game going on. And as each one or one of them wakes up, the only person who is really waking up is the one who set the dream to start with. Because all of them were part of the same dream. And the only one to wake up is the one who set up the dream. Therefore, it is a game of being physical and awakening by the same Lord. And why has he set up this strange game? Why should we go to sleep and dream? The, I can ask you a question. Why do you go to sleep? Do you know sleep is a lower level of consciousness? Is that right? You go to sleep every night, it's a lower level of consciousness. Why do we sleep? We know it. 
very readily. Now I'm done with my work. I'm finished and tired. Had my dinner. Nice. Let's hit the bed and go to sleep. Why? To rest. What? To rest. To rest. Relaxing. From the stress of wakefulness. Hmm. And why do I wake up in the morning? To get off from the stress of sleep. <laughs> and why do I wake up further? To get away from both. <laughs> and why do why does God, the ultimate creator, set back into creation this whole system of the many to get over the loneliness of the one? And why does he then cancel out all this and make arrangements to get back to the one to find out the truth, the reality? So it's a continuous cycle. And it makes sense at every level. The whole thing is so well set up in such a beautiful balance, such an equilibrium. It's a permanent game. Can we uh, hear the story of uh, Narad Muni to uh, simplify? Which one? Uh, where he uh, has the opportunity to talk with, uh, makes his contact with Ram. And then? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which Are you going to tell them? No, no, I'd, I'd like to even tell you. You mean the story of the snake and the parrot? Right. Narad Muni was one of the yogis. Yeah. Muni, Muni means a yogi. Yogis, Munis, Rishis, they are different levels. We use these words for describing the experiences of different people. And Narad was one of those who used to carry, he was dressed very barely dressed and uh, used to carry a chimta. Chimta is that which makes the sound so people's attention could be drawn, he could offer his cup and get offerings and move from place to place. He was a very clever man and generally he used to indulge in gossip and set one against the other. He was a very strange kind of yogi but he was a popular yogi also and uh, he was very good in giving discourses and enlightening people and telling them the truth of higher universal life stream. He used to talk of life stream, tuning in, you know. Sometimes I feel he must have taken birth in many bodies in this country. A lot of people talk of tuning in and a universality of consciousness in which they want to tune in when they feel happy. That kind of teaching he used to do. And he used to wonder that some people just ran to see some living masters who would come. The living master would do nothing but sit there and people would run just to look at them. And he would ask them, Look, I am explaining the intellectual part of spirituality. Why do you run to see that man? Mm -hmm. And the people would say, we are going to have a darshan. 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 You heard this word darshan? What is darshan? The darshan is, darshan is mm -hmm. to look at the, the right within. Look at the master mm -hmm. is darshan. And just to look at him, people would go. Not to ask questions, to debate or to discuss, but just to look at him. He said, this is very strange that people should run to a person just to look at him. So he himself was a yogi of some power and had gone up to the universal mind, to Brahma. So he went into deep meditation and spoke to Brahma with it. He said, Brahma ji, sir, I want to ask you a question today. <laughs> I find that a lot of people run around just having darshan, just to look and gaze at a human being they call a saint or a mystic or a master. What is the benefit they are getting by doing that? What benefit does one get just by looking at a person? Brahma said, Oh, Narad, that's a very important question you have asked. I think if you go to a neighboring village, there is a water pond in that village. In the middle of the pond, there is a snake. And the snake can give you the answer to this question. Why don't you go and ask him? So, obeying the orders of Brahma, which he heard within, so he woke up from meditation, got up from meditation, walked with his chan chan chan, which he was doing, and reached that village and asked the people, is there a pond in this village? They said, yes, right behind that house, you see the pond. So, he went behind the house and he saw a pond and he saw a snake with his head outside. And Narad Muni said, 
Mr. Snake, I have a simple question for you. Hmm. Why do people go and run after the mystics just to have their darshan, just to look at their face? And the snake dropped its head and died. Narada was very surprised. He went into deep meditation again and manifested the Lord Brahma within. And he said, Brahmaji, what is this? You told me to go and meet that snake and get the answer from him. And I put the question to him, what people are getting by having darshan, by looking at a mystic. And the snake died before it could give any answer to me. And Brahma said, oh, is that so? That's very sad. Why don't you go to another village? That's about 20 miles away. You walk over there and uh, there a goldsmith is living. And he has a parrot in a cage tied up in his backyard. You go and ask this question from that parrot. He will give you the answer. So, Narad Muni got up and walked those 20 miles and reached that village. And he asked, the people, if there's a goldsmith living here, they said, yes, that's the house of the goldsmith. So he went there. He met the goldsmith. He said, I believe you have a parrot in your house. He said, sure, Narad Muni, such a yogi coming to my house. I am so blessed. Sure, I have a parrot. What can I do? I want to see and have uh, a communication with that parrot. Mm. And the goldsmith said, that parrot must be very lucky. To be able to see a great yogi like you. So he brought the cage out. And Narad Muni said to the parrot. He said, Mr. Parrot. I want to know what is the advantage. And what is the benefit of having the darshan of these mystics. Like these people are running around to see them. The parrot looked at the yogi. And dropped its head and died. Narad Muni said, this is inexplicable. What is Brahma doing to me? So he went into deep meditation again. And he said, Brahma, what is this happening? Twice you have done this with me. You sent me to the snake and the snake died. You sent me to the parrot and the parrot died. Nobody gives me an answer to my question. Brahma said, oh, that happened? That's very sad. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you this time. In the neighboring kingdom, Several days, several months walk. You reach the neighboring kingdom and go and meet the king. Go to his palace. Because the chief queen there is giving birth to a baby. And go and ask that question from the little baby. The baby might give you an answer. I trembled a little bit. He got up and he was trembling. He says, all right, the snake and a parrot. Not the royal baby. <laughs> anyway, this was the command of uh, his isht. Isht means his, his lord within. So he set on foot. And after several months of travel, eventually he reached the kingdom. And he notified the king of his presence and that he wanted to visit him. The king was very happy. In those days, the kings liked spiritual visitors and yogis and swamis and sadhus to come. So they could discuss spirituality with them. So when the king heard Narad Muni wants to come to the palace, he said, certainly, he welcomed him. So Narad Muni went and the king with open arms came out. He said, welcome Narad Muni, I am so happy, so blessed that you came to my palace. Narad Muni was very quiet and solemn. And his mind was quivering inside. And he said, king, is it true that your wife, the queen, has given birth to a baby? Said, of course, we just had a baby boy. So small and so beautiful. I want to have a meeting with that boy. Baby is born. And I want to have it alone. He was afraid what will happen if they are around. Mm -hmm. So they said, certainly the baby is very blessed. To have the chance to get blessings from a, a holy man like you, Narad Muni. So Narad Muni went inside. They put the baby in the main hall. And they all withdrew. Narad Muni said, Mr. Baby, <laughs> why are all these people running after these mystics and saints and having darshan and looking at their face? And the baby spoke and said, Narad, 
I am the same parrot that you met in the cage. I am the same snake that you met in the pond. You are only a halfway saint. You are a yogi. You are not a saint. But even by seeing you, I lost my life as a snake and went into parrot's life, which was improvement for me. The second time I saw you, just by seeing you, I was able to cut my karma and become human straight away. This has been the benefit directly by seeing you. The benefit of seeing a saint or a perfect mystic is a thousand times more. Mm-hmm. That is how Narad Muni got the supply. That's the story. That's the story. You balance this karma, huh? Because karma is what holds us here. Karma is what puts us in this illusion. Karma is what gives us into reincarnation. Karma is what continues this story of birth after birth after birth. And karma itself is unreal. Karma itself is illusion. And there is nobody to cut it out. We are so used to it that we perpetuate this recreation. And only these mystics, these human beings with consciousness of the mind, consciousness of God themselves, and they are here, merely looking at them, cuts of karma like nothing else does. <laughs> it burns like dry wood or burns away. Such is the state, and karma burns, and we feel our life has become light. Something has happened to us. It's nothing but karma we cut. And eventually, they can cut. If one is initiated by a perfect living master, do you know what he does? In the grace of these masters, he destroys the whole of Sinjit Karma. No reservation, no reservoir left. It is the reservoir that is making us come again and again here. Destroys that one instinct. Because he accepts. Initiation is acceptance. Initiation is not a formal act. Initiation is not whispering words in the ear. Initiation is not teaching you certain words to repeat. Initiation is not telling you the teachings. Initiation is not even disclosing to you the secret message. Initiation is not even disclosing the mysteries of spirituality. Initiation is the acceptance by your master of the responsibility taking you back home. Initiation takes place within ourselves, not outside. Initiation takes place when the Master says, accept you. And from that moment, the entire accountability of your actions, your karma, everything is shifted from the nameless, formless wheel of karma to the well-recognized individual we call the master. And we can deal direct with the master, even about our karma. If it is too heavy, you can say master. Still too heavy. Like okay. Okay. <laughs> like <laughs> say master, I can put up with this. This is not too bad. I'm enjoying myself. Okay, go ahead. You have to have some bit of it to stay here. Do you know why we are here? How do we hold the human body together? How, how are we alive physically? We are physically physically alive because of Prahlad, because of karma, because of relationship with people. We have to take from here, eat here, drink there, talk to some. We can't do a single thing if we have no karma. If we have no karma, we disappear, disintegrate. The fact that, that uh, these elements, these molecules can be held together with the life intact in them, is only possible because of karma that is operating. Because life held together creates an experience with people around. Without experience with people around, we wouldn't be here. Without experience with living things around, we wouldn't be here. Nobody is alive without experience with people and living things around. Each one of us is surviving in physical form because of Give and take taking place constantly between living things. And this give and take between living things is called karma. So if karma were not here, we wouldn't be here. Therefore, when we in the course of this beautiful experience called human life, run into a master and become acquainted with what is karma, he does not say, 
karma ends, then you disintegrate at once. He says, while you are still here with karma, discover and be aware of the reality and how it is operating. While we are still human, still physical, still in the body, still having the relationships of give and take with people, we can rejoice and be happy like never before. Right. So karma changes our life. Karma, karma is reduced and modified in such a way that while it is there, it doesn't hurt. I mean, it does hurt a little bit. <laughs> if you were to get a big blow, you are given a little spank. If you were to get hung up on the gallows, you get a pin break. So it is reduced to such a level that you, it becomes bearable. That's the advantage. When you come in contact with these perfect masters, your karma becomes bearable and becomes easy to put up with. And yet, we become aware it is because of that karma which we are bearing that we are here. Karma does not mean all pinpricks and spanking. Karma also means getting happiness and pleasures and sensations and good food and good uh, money and good clothes and good life. It's also karma. Power over people. It's also karma. <laughs> Everything that is happening here is because of karma. Good and bad both. So we have done good deeds and we are being rewarded for that. We have done bad deeds. We are being punished for that. By doing a particular kind of karma, you can get out of the out of the cycle of birth and rebirth. Supposing somebody says, I want to be a good man. I want to do good deeds. It's nice to be good. God will be pleased if I am good. Fine, God is pleased. Your good will make you very nice, happy next time. If he made you king, make you a rich person, make you a person out of control, power, everything. Why? you? Because you were so good. And then you say, now I got the power and riches, then you become bad. <laughs> so then you get punished. You become poor and sick and praying to Lord, Lord, take me out of this next time, no more. <laughs> he makes you good and healthy and rich again. The cycle goes on. It is not by doing good deeds or bad deeds that you get out of it. And there is no way of not doing any deeds. The trap is such. The physical trap. It is only when a perfect living master, through love and devotion, takes you out of the realm of the mind and discloses to you that this karma itself is illusion. That the birth, rebirth itself is illusion. There is no such thing as reincarnation. It's an illusion set up to create an experience like we are having. When he takes you above this, then you find the real peace. It is not by actions that you find that peace. It is by initiation, by acceptance of the Lord. When He accepts you and you have love and devotion and service for the Lord, you get away from there. There is a saying in India, Jaha asa, taha vasa, which means wherever your longing is, there you will go. Mm -hmm. That's a good secret. Wherever your longing is, that's where you will go. If you find a man running to the wine shop and you like the man, run after him, you will get wine eventually. <laughs> but if you find a man loving the Lord and running towards God, you long for that man and run after him, you will also go to the Lord. Therefore, in this life, it is the longing for the Master, the longing for the Beloved of the Lord it takes us to the Lord. Because we don't know the Lord, except through that experience of the human being. If we really have longing for the Lord, we would gather together, think of the Lord, sing His praises, meet people who are singing His praises, and experience the love which comes automatically in us for those who are singing the same kind of songs. <laughs> Notice that. Yes. It is so natural for us. But then we feel we are all longing for the same thing. We are going in the same direction. Therefore, he said, Gun Gobind Gayo Nahi Janam Karati. If you have not sung the praise of the Lord, you wasted your life. Sing the praise of the Lord. Why? That makes you long for the Lord. That longing leads you to look for those who are singing the praise of the Lord. And that longing 
takes you to follow those who are going in the direction of the Lord. And wherever your longing is, you will go mentally there. It's beautiful that. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Do you uh, give us uh, the essence of when the Master says, take pain and pleasure is the same? Can you give us the essence of what that really means? It means don't be judgmental. That's the essence. If somebody gives you pain, you judge him. Okay, wait till my turn comes. <laughs> Somebody gives you pleasure, you say, I'll pray to the Lord for you. You have been good to me. It's judgmental. If you take the both as events from the Lord, same Lord, equal. You are non-judgmental. If somebody honors you, say, you are a great guy. I love you. May the Lord shower his blessings on you. Somebody dishonors you, you say, okay, you wait and see. If I can't do anything, the Lord will punish you. You see, people say that. Believers, Say, this means you are so judgmental. How can we judge? What Christ says? Judge not. That ye be not judged. We are judged when we judge others. So the essence of the teaching is don't be judgmental. Live in his will. Equally. He sends a little a little package of pleasure, open it and say, wow. A little package of pain. Wow, that's great. He makes somebody attack you. He makes somebody praise you. Because it's all coming from the same Lord. He's the director of the whole show. When you are acting on a stage, the director says, Dwight, speak these words. You speak those words. As a villain. So it's a good actor. Say, speak like a hero. Speak the heroic language. Good actor. It's not the language, whether you are speaking of this role or that role, that makes you good actor. It's the effectiveness with which you speak your script that makes you good actor. In this life, it is the effectiveness in which we play our role that makes us the beloved of the Lord. And then we use the mind to become judgmental and judging everything that comes to us. Pleasure and pain, honor and dishonor, we get trapped. We forget the Lord. Then we make the mind, our judging mind, as our master. That is the meaning. You heard yeah. that you you want to find a little moat in the eye of the other person. What about the big beam in your own eye? Even when we try to judge somebody, we try to judge that person is not very good. At that very point, before pointing an accusing finger, turn this person. Say, what about you? Look at yourself and your past. You'll have no right to look at anybody. What are our merits? Have you forgotten our life? Even this life? And if we remember our past lives, we would say, oh Lord, it's your blessings that we are here. We never deserve. Where is the scope for Attacking anybody else. That is why. Don't be affected by pain or pleasure. By honor, by dishonor. Take them as equal gifts from the Lord. He wants you to live in that state or in that state. It's His will. Rejoice! He gave you a chance to live in His will. Rejoice! He gave you the awareness that He exists and you are living in His will. And that happens. You have made it to the spiritual path.